evening and welcome to Book Passage. Um, thank you for all coming out on a Wednesday night and supporting your favorite authors. Uh, when you come out to these events, you really support your favorite authors and also help us remain a thriving independent bookstore. So thank you for being here. Um, my name is Melissa and I have the honor of introducing the extraordinary storyteller John Lescois. John is the author of more than 20 books from legal thrillers to crime fiction, including the New York Times bestsellers Damage, Treasure Hunt, and The Thirteenth Juror. John has been a dedicated friend to Book Passage here for many years and has always been part of our annual Mystery Writers Conference. And we have been so thankful and lucky to have him as part of our family here. Um, we also have our mystery conference coming up, and we've got information up here for any of you who are interested. Um, I have a feeling that many of you here are fans of John's <laughs> because you're not at Eve Ensler tonight. So uh, John comes to us tonight with his latest book, The Ophelia Cut, uh, which was just released a few weeks ago and has already climbed to number 15 on the New York Times bestseller list. I think we need applause. Yeah. In the Ophelia Cut, John brings back his most popular protagonist, Demas Hardy. Dismas. Dismas. Oh, gosh. Woo. We were going to talk Sam about Dismas. that. Sam Demas. That's all right. Okay, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, and he catapults us into a story that is rife with tension, grit, moral complexity, and suspense that will keep you reading until the sun rises. I especially love what best-selling author Brad Thor has to say about the Ophelia Cut. The Ophelia Cut is hands down the best legal thriller I have read in years and a perfect case study for why readers love the brilliant John Lescois. Smart, riveting, and utterly compelling, the Ophelia Cut has an incredible cast of characters from whom you which... Oh, he's blushing. <laughs> for which you will not want to depart, I guarantee you will not be disappointed. On the coattails of those true and stellar words, may we please give a warm welcome to author and master storyteller, John Lescois. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, the brilliant John Lescois is actually my cousin. <laughs> he lives in Ridgewood, uh, right near Harlan Coben, and they, they work out together. So it's, <laughs> You know, it's a small world, and it's true that, uh, you know, I call him the brilliant John Lesquois. So when Brad was so nice to say that, I called him up and told him he got the wrong one, but I was glad he said it anyway. Anyway, it's great to be back here at uh, Book Passage. I have, I've been here, I guess, at least 15 times, and every time is new and different and exciting. Tonight I have a couple of little uh, giveaway items. In fact, I'll show you one right now. This is my not very new, but still the same yeah, CD. Uh, that features a bunch of my country music and uh, all original stuff. And if anybody, uh, well, we'll have a we'll have a contest later tonight. Somebody, some lucky fan, will walk away with this incredible, powerful. So anyway, I do want to uh, thank uh, Book Passage again. Thank Melissa for that nice intro, and Sam for being here, and Bill for being here, and all of you for being here. Uh, I've just gotten back from uh, about. 12 days on the road, and I'm a little bit groggy, so bear with me until I get into my gear, and then I'll uh, be rolling here. Um, this book uh, came out two weeks ago, as Melissa said, and it, it, the first week on the list was wonderful to see. And um, I thought I would talk about kind of the journey to get to, um, to, get to being a bestseller. I've been very lucky. I've had 16 now in a row. and. Uh, it's, it's hard to imagine that I didn't start making a living as a writer until I was 45 years old. So for all of you who want to try and keep doing it, try and keep doing it because it's dual. It's, uh, it's not easy. Oh, Sheldon Siegel is here. Talk about the book. Sheldon. Um, it's really weird. It's, it's a weird last name. 
Um, anyway, I thought I'd talk just for a minute because people always ask me, you know, how did you get started? How did it, how did it all begin? And was it was it just ordained? Was it just a natural thing that you fell into? So I thought I'd tell the story of my first book, which is, you know, it's it's kind of an easy tale to get into, and uh, it'll show you why uh, I'm in the business and why I love it so much. Um, when I uh, got finished playing rock and roll, and, and I think most of you know I was a rock and roll singer until I was 30. I quit on my 30th birthday, I left my band, Johnny Capo and his real good band, <laughs> and I said, we're done, I broke up the band, and I said, I'm going to write a novel, I'm going to become a famous novelist. And all of my, my band members were appalled, but they said, okay, we'll go form another band and you go and write your book. So I wrote my book, I finished my book in about two and a half months, and it was a story about set in Spain during the uh, time that Franco was dying. This was before Saturday Night Live made a big joke of Franco dying every week. But <clears throat> this was in, in, in true fact what was going on when I was there. And I decided to write a literary novel. Before that, and when I was in college, I had finished one book-length work and uh, didn't show it to anybody, which is a good thing. Uh, and when I got finished with college, I decided I would now write a, a bit, bit longer book-length work uh, that would incorporate some of the things I learned as an English major in Berkeley. Uh, one of the things I was trying to work with was the idea of adding a plot to books. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did. I sat down and I wrote a mystery story uh, based on the idea that Nero Wolfe was the son of Sherlock Holmes. And I finished it and I showed it to my father. And he said it was fantastic, he really enjoyed it. I said, what should I do with it? He said, well, I don't know. Um, just don't try to be a writer, because you'll know, <laughs> never make any money. You know, it's a great hobby. And, you know, my dad was a writer his whole life and never published anything, but he was always writing sketches. And so it was kind of cool. I said, that's great. OK, thanks, Dad. So and it was OK, because it was a mystery anyway. You know, and I wasn't going to be a mystery guy. I was a serious literary dude. And so when I finally quit my band and I was 30 years old, I uh, sat down and I wrote this literary book. It was very pretentious, frankly. Uh, it had the narrator in the first, second, and third persons. I did a lot of experimenting. There was a lot of stuff going on. It still was a little bit, I'd have to say, light on the plot aspect. But I finished this book and I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but this time now, you know, older than I was when I showed my dad the earlier book, I, I showed it to my old high school teacher. And I didn't, hadn't seen him, of course, in 12 years. And his name was Terry Jones, and I sent the book to him. And he called me up a couple of days later, and he, I said, I'm so glad you called me. This is so great. He goes, well, I have to tell you the book sucked. <laughs> it's really not a very good book. And I don't think you should try to show it to anybody. I think you ought to just get rid of it. I said, wow, okay, that's harsh. So the next day, as luck would have it, his wife called me up, and he had left the book on the bedside table. And she picked it up, and she loved the book. <laughs> and she said, John, I just love this book, and I didn't know this woman from Eve either. I mean, you know, it's just my high school teacher's wife. I mean, it was like, okay. I said, well, what do you think I should do? And she said, well, I think it's, you know, brilliant and literary, and you should enter it into a literary award. I said, wow, I didn't think it was, you know, I never thought of myself as a literary guy, really. I mean, I wanted to be thought of, but, you know, I had never done anything. She goes, I think this is a great book. I said, well, how do I go about doing that? She says, well, as it turns out, Terry was waiting to finish his novel all these years, and he hasn't done it, and I've got an a bunch of applications to literary <laughs> awards. <laughs> so why don't I just enter you in one? And I said, you'll do that? She said, I will. I said, fantastic. So she did. She entered, in, entered into, into an award, and six months later I was sitting at Guitar Player Magazine where I was the advertising director, the first of many day jobs. And um, I got a call saying this woman, Susan Kelly, called from the San Francisco Foundation saying I had won the Joseph Henry Jackson Award for Best Novel by a California Author. I went, give me a break. Is this the best thing ever? And I thought it was the best thing ever. I immediately walked in. I quit the day job. <laughs> this would be, become a theme. So I, I quit the day job. I decided I was going to go back and write another novel right away. And I was ready to go and, you know, capture the world, capture Hollywood, capture New York. Well, a mere four years went by. 
Every agent in New York had seen by now, seen this book. Every publisher that I had ever thought to send it to had seen the book. Everybody had said no to the book. But fate, the hand of fate, rolled in again, and my brother Mike went to a Berkeley High School basketball game where he run in, ran into an old girlfriend of mine that I dated in high school. Now, this is a woman I hadn't seen in 16 years. We're way, way beyond high school now. And Margie said to Mike, so what's John up to? You know, what's he been doing? And Mike said, well, he's just a loser. He's <laughs> <laughs> just awful. He's, um, you know, he's, he's living in a stupid walk-up apartment in San Francisco, and he wrote this stupid book that he won this stupid award with, and now he thinks he's a writer, so he's writing, but nobody's buying anything, and he's just a complete loser. And Margie said, well, God, I'd really like to see, you know, his, uh, his book. Because, you know, we dated and he was fun and blah, blah, blah. So Mike goes, okay, well, I'll see. So he went to Margie and he said, uh, I mean, he came to me and he said, Margie would like to read your book. And luckily there was a lot of uh, books because uh, nobody was asking for them. <laughs> and I had at least five copies. So I sent one to Margie. She read it. She loved it. Didn't even tell me she loved it. She just loved it. She looked up publishers in the Yellow Pages in Los Angeles opened up to publishers, found Pinnacle Books, the only publisher in LA, walked the manuscript down with her little baby Pram and her two other children, handed it to the secretary across the desk, and they bought the book the next day. So when people ask me, how did that happen? I go, duh, this is the easy thing to do. You know, you just plan it the way I did. You can see every step is carefully mapped out. <laughs> And uh, that gets you on your way. Well, then once you're on your way, you think, okay, I've got a book published. Now I'm going to be continuing here. I'm going to now write, go with another book, because I'd already written two more manuscripts. Both of them big, and both of them had plots. I was thinking, this is going to work. This is great. But <clears throat> unfortunately, a few years went by. My, uh, son, my book, Sunburn, the one that won the award, did finally come out. And it was a beautiful kind of semi-pornographic cover. Um, really good for a literary novel, but, you know, they didn't put the award on the cover because they thought it would drive people away from buying the book. Yeah. Anyway, I was just starting to learn about how publishers worked, and that was one moment that I went, this is kind of interesting. Um, so anyway, I tried for about three more years to get books published, and nothing happened. By this time, I was working for the Guardians of the Jewish Homes for the Aging in Los Angeles, where I was their associate director. And I was, um, you know, I was trying to keep it going, but I was kind of depressed. And I decided I want to be around books, and I want to be around people who write books. And if I can't publish, at least I want to be in that venue and in that world. So I applied to the University of Massachusetts Creative Writing Program, and I got in. So that was going to change my life. So I quit my job, day job and came back east to go to Massachusetts, but I made a little pit stop first in Washington, D.C., where my wife, Lisa, was finishing, she wasn't my wife at the time, but she was finishing up her architectural degree in Alexandria, Virginia. So to pay the bills during that summer, just before I was going to go away to grad school, I um, played guitar in a bunch of the Irish pubs in Old, Old Town, Alexandria, and I also am a great, great, brilliant perhaps, typist. <laughs> you know, when the chips are down, I can type with the best of them. And this was a very lucrative way to make a living in those days, before really word processing had totally taken over. And so I went to work for a, a consulting firm. And in the midst of this summer typing my little fingers off, this gentleman comes in who's my big boss. And he goes, John, I see you've written a novel. I had barely spoken to this man. I said, yes, I have. He goes, well, then that means you can write, doesn't it? I said, seems like. He went, well, we got a problem. He said, I got this big thing going on now with this, uh, you know, this lawsuit that the, you're typing all the data for, and, and we don't have anybody who can put it in a narrative. We don't know what we're trying to say. We know the data, but we don't know what we're trying to say. He says, and I'd like you to write it for us. I said, You'd like me to write your law brief? He goes, yeah. 
I said, okay, what's it on? He goes, well, it's on the revenue adequacy of the Burlington Northern Railroad. <laughs> now, I know all of you are familiar with that, but I didn't, I didn't know anything about the revenue adequacy of the Burlington Northern Railroad. But I studied, and the guy, you know, who's going to pay me more money than I was getting for typing? And in two weeks, I wrote a 400-page legal brief compiling all the data. And we won a $42 million lawsuit. <laughs> So, filthy lucre <laughs> stole me away from publishing. They offered me a job as a technical writer, a full-time job, and for two years in Washington, D.C., that's what I did. And then, truly suicidal, I turned to my bride and said, I can't do this at all anymore. I have to be a writer. I really want to be a writer, and I don't mean the Burlington Northern stuff. I really want to write the books. And I said, the only problem is I don't have any books. I don't have anything. I've just, everything's been rejected by everybody. And she said, well, you know that Sherlock Holmes book you wrote when you were 23 years old? I said, yeah. She goes, I really like that book. I think you ought to send it out. I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a literary guy. <laughs> I've won this big literary award, and that is not only a mystery, it's a derivative mystery about Sherlock Holmes and Nero Wolf. It's not even my characters. And Lisa goes, I thought it was really fun to read, though. I thought it was great. So I said, well, I don't have anything else. I might as well send that out. So I sent it out. We left to Europe. We went away, quit the day jobs, did the whole thing even before I had a new job. Spent a few months in Europe and came back. And on the day we landed, we heard that my book that I had written when I was 22 and now I was 36. And I had never showed to anyone except my father, who told me, don't try to get it published, <laughs> Dad. <laughs> Got two offers for hardcover publishing in New York. And the great news is, not only did they buy the book, they wanted a sequel. So I went to LA, I moved to LA, I got a job now, daytime job, word processing, because I'd moved up from typist to word processor. <laughs> you know, that's really not a funny part of the story. <laughs> but it is if you've been there. <laughs> so I, I started working at a firm called eight, uh, called Pettit and Martin in um, yeah. in LA. And I worked there for six years. And my schedule during those six years was I would get up in the morning, I was still writing books. I'd write a book, I'd write a book. I'd write four pages of a book out in my garage uh, between six and eight in the morning. And about from nine to five, I worked as the word processing supervisor at Pettit and Martin. And at five o'clock, I would go downstairs, have a bag lunch on the steps. And then I would go around the tall buildings, downtown LA, finding other law firms that needed things typed or word processed. And I did that till 11 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. And so that was my schedule for only a mere six years. Mm -hmm. During that time, I published three other books, Rasputin's Revenge, the first of the Dismas Hardy books, and, a book, and the second one called The Vig. Um, a total of about 75 people read those books. <laughs> so I wasn't exactly killing the whole world, but you know, at least I thought I was publishing and all was working out pretty well. And then when I was 41, one day I went out body surfing and I got, I got wiped out, which is common and I didn't, didn't bother me at all. But evidently some uh, bad seawater got in my ears and I was sick the next day. I had an earache and didn't feel very good. By the middle of the night, I was sitting on the floor and uh, kind of, you know, not being co coherent. And my wife came in and uh, she realized that I wasn't my usual jovial self and said, you know, I think I'm gonna take you to the hospital. So in the middle of the night, with her five-month baby and our 19-month-old baby in tow, she took me to the hospital, and the doctor told her that she should find somebody to take the kids, because I was gonna die in two hours. <laughs> and uh, I was supposedly gonna die in two hours. I had very advanced spinal meningitis. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> then I, um, you know, went into a coma. And I was in a coma for 11 days. When I came out, I said, number one, my galleys for the VIG were there waiting for me in the hospital. But uh, I decided that I was going to stop doing what I'd been doing. I'm going to quit all the day jobs. And I was going to try to meld the literary side of me 
that really cared about the words and cared about the themes and the bigger issues. And also, I wanted to have the suspense stuff, the plot stuff, the, the good stuff um, that made it fun to read. And so I sat down and, and for some really ridiculous reason decided to write a legal thriller, which I had never done before. And I'm not a lawyer, in spite of working in law firms. I'd never been to law school. I knew nothing about the law. But I sat down and I wrote a very big book called Hard Evidence. I, pan I handed it in to my publisher, who is still Don Fine. He typically did not pay me. And uh, I was kind of sitting here now. I'd moved up to uh, Northern California into God's country. I live in Davis now. And had a great, you know, great life going on, but I was watching the kids full time. It's the best thing I've ever done in my life is when my wife went and supported me. And uh, it was wonderful learning to know my kids and, and having a, a totally different worldview about what life was all about. Having also survived this really pretty serious disease. I just decided I was going to throw it all at this one book, and I did. Even though I didn't get paid for it, I said, oh well, I like doing this, I like my character, I'm going to write another one. And while I was writing the other one, I got a call, my publisher got a call from Germany and from Japan, and they were both offering six-figure deals for the book that I had written, Hard Evidence. And I'm going, it could happen, this could actually happen. Now when you hear six figures, you say, wow, it's $100,000. That's pretty cool. Now you should know though the way they pay in the publishing industry. You get one payment, it's usually five payments. And you get one payment when you sign the deal, and the second payment when you deliver the book, and the third payment when your hardcover gets released, and the fourth payment when your paperback gets released. And all these are a year apart. And you get your fifth payment when they colonize the moon. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it wasn't like I was gonna get rich automatically, but at least it gave me hope to sit down and try to write another book. And I sat down now and decided to write a book about the battered women's syndrome. I was looking for a really big, good idea that was not really part of the public lexicon. And that was the book that, that came to my mind and came to you know, my, everybody that I talked to about it said, this is a great idea, you should write this book. So I sat down and I wrote another big law book. I had a horrible, furious time with Donald I. Fine where he was threatening to sue me every day because I didn't accept his first offer for the book or his second or his third. I didn't accept any offers. Because I'm a weird guy and I think if he says he's gonna pay me, he ought to pay me. What do you think? Yep. He didn't though. I mean, he was, well, I'll tell you a little story when the 13th juror came out. This is a little off the topic, but I'll come right back. When the 13th juror came out, I finally had enough, a little bit of extra money that I could decide to pay an accountant to go and audit Donald Fine's books. Because we had been so violently at odds, and he was fighting so hard to keep me. And I, as far as I know, I had made him no more than like $3,000 over five years. And I said, why am, why am I being the guy he's fighting for? Mm -hmm. So the auditor shows up, and the day the auditor shows up, Donald Fine cuts me a check for $130,000. Mm -hmm. He'd been holding out on you. He'd been holding out on me for about four years during which time, you know, I was working those six to 11 things. Anyway, I'm not bitter about that because he's dead now. You know? <laughs> <You're not. laughs> so <That'll do> it. <laughs> so um, anyway, I finished the 13th juror and luckily, it, was a, it turned out luckily, it was about the battered women's syndrome and this was just when the O.J. Simpson trial had begun. And the, the battered women's syndrome became kind of the big thing in the whole country and I was invited to speak on about 150 radio programs over the course of three months. And then my book came out and it was a big bestseller. It was on the bestseller list for several months. It sold in 30, 40 countries. Mm -hmm. And it may be a bestseller. And since that time, I'm so glad to say, every book has been a bestseller. And now that I've told you how easy it is and how you can do it, I want you all to go out and write your books and, uh, you know, come back here and be up on your podium <laughs> selling your books. Anyway, that's my basic story, and I think uh, some of you may have known it before, known parts of it. But if you'd like to talk about anything, I am here and at your disposal. Yes? Where did Dismas Hardy come from? Dismas Hardy came from a twisted Catholic background. The <laughs> <laughs> good thief. That makes sense. The good thief. I mean, the name comes from the good thief. Um, but you know, it's really interesting. Dismas Hardy was a name that kind of popped into my mind when I was in high school. 
Uh, I was a fan of Mirror Wolf and Sherlock Holmes and, and, and John D. McDonald's guy, Travis McGee. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that I would write my, I mean, re really, this is how I thought as a young man. I thought I would write my serious literary books. And I'd come out with one of those every year or two. And then, in the, you know, the little interesting scenes between them, I'll write mysteries with a kind of, you know, recurring character. So my recurring character was a guy, I love the name Dismas Hardy. And the book I wrote in college actually had a character named Dismas Hardy in it. That book, which no one has ever read and no one ever will read, maybe, you might, go to my archives, you can check it out, it's still existent. But Dismas, Dismas Hardy, in that book, the, the conceit of that book was what made uh, capital punishment cruel and unusual, was the fact that people knew about it. So I thought if the condemned person didn't know that he was going to be executed, you know, it's not cruel and unusual. And unusual. It just takes care of the business of getting rid of the guy. Everything's cool. So the guy that was the guy who got put away and, and, and you know, he gets the flu shot that turns out to be actually cyanide in my book that no one's ever going to read. That guy is named Dismas Hardy. So he walks in, he gets the shot, he dies. That's it. Then four years later, five years later, ten years later, whatever it was that I decided to start writing this kind of, you know, real mystery stories, um, the name just was there. He was right, right at the front. And I said, okay, here's Dismas Hardy. And I, I modeled him after me at the time, which was 38 years old, um, divorced, living in San Francisco, working as a bartender at the Little Shamrock. All of those things were Hardy, I mean, were me. But luckily, at the end of my little descriptive moment that I gave to Hardy, I also said that he was a, you know, he was an ex-Marine, he was an ex-cop, an ex-attorney, <coughs> He was divorced, and he was uh, an ex-father. And I just gave him a bunch of that baggage to carry with him. And luckily, it's all bloomed into who he's become. You know, within a couple of pages of writing those words, he was already not me. But I kind of knew who he was and who, where he came from. He's a great character. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So the FBI. So just... FBI? Yeah. I'll take a picture of it. Okay. Paparazzi. Okay. <laughs> you mentioned that uh, early in your story you applied to UMass Creative Writing Program. Yeah. Jake, I, I have a follow-up question to this one too, but just out of curiosity, what drew you to that particular program at that time? Um, I was, I was kind of, I've had a weird education. I, I got into Cal Santa Cruz the year that it opened. And at that time, it was the hardest school to get into in the country, and I got in, and I only applied there. And so I only thought you applied to one college. And I kind of, I had been in Boston before, uh, when I was younger, I was playing music there. And I wanted to go back to Boston, so even though that's not in Boston, but it's Massachusetts, I thought it'd be fun to go back there, so I applied there. Okay. And they let me in. Yeah, you, you attended the University of San Francisco from 1967 to 1968, no? Yes. Yep. One year. Yeah, one year. Yeah. What led you there and then led you on to Cal after that? It was money. Okay. It was money. Yeah. Um, I have been on my own in terms of this is, I mean, this doesn't sound real in the real world, but my family had a, uh, I have a family of seven kids, and my mom and dad, you know, were struggling to make it with us. Uh, not that I think we were poverty stricken, but, you know, we all learned that if we wanted to do things, we had to do it ourselves. So I was basically on my own in terms of buying my own clothes and dental and everything from about the age of 14. And so um, when I got out, I paid for my own high school. I went to Sarah High School. Um, and that was my life. I mean, I didn't think it was weird or bad. It's just what I did. But then right after high school, I went to work on the dredges uh, in Delaware. I had a nice summer job. And I was, you know, I made, I thought, a ton of money, maybe, you know, $1,300 for the summer. <laughs> And I went to Santa Cruz, got a job as the manager of the McDonald's there in Santa Cruz, mm -hmm. and still lasted only three months because I ran out of money. Mm -hmm. So then I went back home to Belmont. I crashed with my parents for the second half of my freshman year and went to College of San Mateo. University of San Francisco during that time wrote me and said they gave me a scholarship to come. So I got there and it turns out that was a little bait and switch. It wasn't a scholarship, it was a loan but I was already there and Vietnam was going on, so I wasn't gonna leave. And having been raised a Catholic and, and having lost my faith over the years, 
um, that really didn't help for, <laughs> for making me want to stay in a Jesuit institution. So I just looked around and I got a scholarship to Berkeley and I went there and that's where I graduated. <laughs> that's never been asked. You know, all the times I've talked, no one's ever talked about my college years and you know, they're, they're bleak. <laughs> they're bleak. You're not alone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How or why did you decide to kill off the older oh, oh, attorney? Oh, oh, oh. You can't ask that kind of question. Why did I decide? Why do I decide to do anything in fiction? Because he was a really, he was a he good was, guy. I love the guy. He was a good guy. I mean, you, yeah, but you can't ask why I killed I'm not going to say his name. Anyway, for those of you who haven't read some of my books, one of them dies. One of the people dies. And, um, I just thought why I did it is we, because I had I to do it. Everybody here has already read all your books. Okay. No. Well, all right. Well, get Not ready. Really. It only gets okay. worse. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you know, it kills me to kill people. It does. And, and, but unfortunately, in the, in the crime genre, <laughs> that's what you have to have happen. And in that particular book, what Hardy and Glitzky and Moses and Gina were all going to have to do was so completely outside of their characters and something they just didn't want to do that so mm -hmm. something major had to happen to, to make them see, see what, that was the only option. Okay. So that's why I did it. Okay. But it breaks my heart. It does still. I miss them. Yeah. 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 Have you ever thought about having a, a mystery tied in with a publisher who's ripping off the <laughs> 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 You know, here's a funny quote. And you think, you know, I, you know, and I always feel at these, in these kind of intimate gatherings that, you know, I really feel a connection to all of you people, truly, I do. And I, I say these things and I try to tell you what it was really like, but I am not even beginning to scratch the surface of what it was like to be published by Donald Fine. <laughs> I'll give you a small example, it doesn't have so much to do with me, but when I first moved up to Sacramento, we got together with a woman uh, named, who was, a, uh, she was in the Mystery Writers of America, so I met this woman named Karen Kievsky, and she's a really great person, she used to write the Cat Colorado series, maybe, maybe some of you have read her, I don't know, nice person, and she got together, she was kind of a, a, kind of a movement shaker, and she got a bunch of us guys from that area together, and among the people were me, Steve Martini, Dale Brown, Richard Herman, Bill Wood. So it was five people, four of whom had been discovered by Donald I. Fine, and all of whom had been badly ripped off by Donald I. Fine. So we got, we got together every month and had a dinner, and we called it Dinner with Karen and the Boys. And one day, Karen comes in and she goes, did you guys hear Donald Fine died? And Dale Brown stands up and he goes, yeah! <laughs> He's go, he goes, I've got my plane. Let's all fly back there and dance on his grave. <laughs> that's, really, that's how we all feel about Don. Uh, there were just some moments that were unbelievable. But the publishing, you know, the publishing thing back then was a little bit more uh, carefree. I mean, I don't think they, they thought of themselves as big businesses all the time. Certainly Don Fine didn't. But he did a bunch of, you know, Ponzi scheme type things like, like when the 13th juror got bought, he bought it for, let's say, $60,000 and then <clears throat> didn't pay me any money, even on the first payment or anything, until he'd sold, he'd sold the paperback rights to Dell and they paid, paid him $300,000, so he paid me $5,000. Oh, he was out of New York. He was out of New York. I mean, really, I can't tell you, 10 years of my life was spent just trying to get enough money to live on from Donald Fine. And that's why when I decided to, you know, get a new agent and, and try to do something based on the success of the 13th juror, I was really kind of a hard guy, you know. And, but, but it was good because I, I, was, I was able to get a good agent. And my agent is still that agent, Barney Carpfinger. And I asked him for two and a half million dollars up front. And he got it for me in four days. And that changed my life, as you might imagine. I mean, it was winning the lottery. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I had that moment when the iron was hot and I had spent a long time waiting for it, so I had planned what I was going to do when it came. And I flew back to New York. I still had no actual cash, and I just said, I need two and a half million dollars, really, right away. And that was it. So, it worked. Yay! <laughs> yeah. 
He's a 13th juror. Was that your third Dismas Hardy book then? Fourth Dismas Hardy book. So yeah. what about the first three? Are they kind of... Once Dead Irish, the they come back up and oh yeah, those books are published all over the world. I've read them, but I just wonder yeah. whether, whether they got successful again. Also, oh sure, yeah, they're they're all um, I don't know if they're, they're, none of them are bestsellers, but they they continue to sell all the time. I give royalty statements every you know six months on six months. There's another thing, by the way. <laughs> Does anybody else know about the internet <laughs> and about how we can like track things quickly? The publishing industry, industry still pays six months out. You know? <laughs> we shouldn't have started talking about this. You <laughs> see the anger is still there. Yes, go ahead. That gentleman that came down the aisle from the FBI. Sam Barry, yeah, he's an FBI guy. Yes. Well, I'm from the IRS and we want to know what you did with that 200. <laughs> <laughs> it's all clean. You don't, you don't like <laughs> you don't write about money laundering like I do and not have it clean. <laughs> and he's not a tea party guy. So no, <laughs> it's, no, it's all good. Yeah. What is your connection to the little shamrock? I was a bartender there. You were. So yeah. When I first came to San Francisco, one of the first things I did is I went into the little shamrock with my drummer. I was still being a musician, and uh, my drummer and I sat down at the bar, and there was a really cool guy, really big character behind the bar. And his name was Mike Mahoney. Think Moses McGuire. I mean, it's very much my guy. And he sat down, and we we're just drinking, you know, and I have a beer, and, you know, he says, so what do you do? And I said, well, I've just won this really cool award, and I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be writing full time. I'm going to try. And he goes, writers in here can't buy drinks. And he just gave my money back to me, and I said, I love this bar. <laughs> and uh, within a couple of weeks, I was bartending there part time, and within a you know a few months, pretty full time. Is it still there? Still there? Oh, yeah, still yeah, it's a great place. Was there yesterday? Really? <laughs> because of your book? <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. yeah. I sat. I truly haven't never heard of you before, my dad. But then we came to San Francisco. We have spent all of San Francisco going to little places of your book. Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sam's a nice place. <laughs> We went to that is so cool! My first I'm going to write a book yeah. about it for <laughs> places that John does go on the I'll let you know. So okay. People keep laughing at us because we keep going to other places. Did you see? The Shamrock is really pretty cool in terms yes. of we've got a little we shrine to me there, and Sam's, you know, I'm next to the door. <laughs> it's true. It's San Francisco story. Two books. I do. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, it was interesting hearing how just Miss Hardy came to be. Mm -hmm. How did Abe Glitzky come to be? Well, Abe Glitzky came to be because I needed a cop. You know, my guy was a bartender. I mean, he, I didn't want to write a Jessica Fletcher, you know, murder she wrote kind of story. I wanted it to have like a legitimate crime element to it. And I didn't know anything about crime. So I knew that my guy, I didn't want him to be a bartender snooping around. I needed somebody to do legitimate investigating. And so just randomly, I, you know, basically said, oh, Hardy's going to go to the Giants game at Candlestick Park and meet his old partner, Abe Glitzky. And Abe Glitzky is based on my bass player in the old days, who's now a dentist in Santa Cruz named Alan Height. <laughs> and, you know, he's got a, a, a white father, a white Jewish father and a black mother. And he's, you know, six foot three and looks like a tight end. And Alan's a great guy. He doesn't have a scar through his lips, but he's still my good buddy. I, I talk to him all the time. So. Do you know that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, I mean, I, I think he shamelessly peddles it to get clients. <laughs> <laughs> says, I'm, I'm actually John Lesquois, you know, alter ego, good guy, bad guy, cop. You know, yeah. Um, I'm a new reader. I've only read a couple of your books and out of order, and you just start at the beginning. But um, what do you, are you, are, is, are your books like a vehicle to talk about, you know, San Francisco, or they to talk about a certain way of looking at life, or... You know, do you have any sort of meta, like, things that drive you or where you try to oh, go ultimately? Or that's anything? a real good question. Um, I think, yes, I, I have come to view the books more as a whole than as individuals. I mean, I didn't at first, of course. But um, I have tried to kind of create a, I mean, I hope I do this, a, a vision of kind of like moral people trying to get by. And I think um, I give them problems that tend to be not just physically <clears throat> difficult but morally ambiguous that they have to work out. This book, The Ophelia Cut, is a, a real example of that. Everybody there is put through the you know, uh, ethical ringer in this book. And, and what I try to do is write 
you know, compelling stories that have to do, though, with people dealing with things that they're not expecting and, and how they deal with them with grace, hopefully, and some courage. I seem to remember on yeah. that theme that a number of times your books have come out and have actually been in the process of being published when the... Something happens. Something happens. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. I, I've, had, I've had these weird moments in these books damage that... Is, well, is damage is a good example. Um, well, uh -huh. it also just happened recently where, where um, I wrote Treasure Hunt about, you know, um, embezzling, you know, charities embezzling things in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw it, but just two or three weeks ago, they had 16 people arrested for embezzling $12 million. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's just really crazy. But the, the, the craziest one of all was uh, I was writing about the, I don't know if you remember, but maybe 10 years ago, there was a big dispute in, in the state about whether MTBE or ethanol should be added to yes. gasoline. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a book called Nothing But the Truth and the whole, you know, the whole squabble about whether they, which one is better and which one should be used and all of that stuff. And the book ends with the governor of the state outlawing MTBE in, in California. And in the book I put on March 26th or whatever it was, the governor signed this thing. Well, it was a year before the book came out. When the book came out, he signed that bill on that exact day. <laughs> they actually had a thing on California Woo! Chronicles where they had the Jaws theme song behind me going, nur, 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 nur. <laughs> Because that really happened a lot in my early books, and it made me just feel like I was, you know, probably had my finger on the pulse of what was happening. You are in the zeitgeist. In the zeitgeist, yeah. Yeah. As a native San Franciscan, I appreciate your accuracy about San Francisco. Yeah. You know, I try to be accurate, but I, I, there's one thing that I just, I, I, sometimes I'm just not on purpose, because I needed to have a tennis court, for example, on Broadway. Yeah. And I put that in, and I, I've got maybe 2,000 emails. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I don't want to go. I, I told my assistant, finally, I said, you know, if I get this again from now on, here's the answer. Just say, I made it up. It's fiction. I made it up. But, uh, yeah, I try to get that right. Man. You know, the other thing that's really bad is people hate it when you don't say Lincoln Way. God forbid you say Lincoln Boulevard, which I did once, much to my chagrin and shame. But, um, no, I tried to get that right. Where on Broadway? The tennis court. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, because, because, Up at the top. Oh, because, well, not in the middle of the you know, be, North Beach. There used to be a tennis court and basketball hoops at like Broadway and Polk. That's what I meant. That's <laughs> <laughs> what I was talking about. I'm having my assistant change I, I, my yeah, answer. I'm just trying to give you, you know, so you can come back. Oh, that's funny. That's great. Yeah. I just when uh, you've talked about how the district attorney takes now helps you validate the legal aspects of yeah. those. Mr. Gene, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was just going to say, yeah. say a shout out to him. You've shouted out to other people. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to shout out to my friend Al Giannini. He does all my legal stuff because I'm not a lawyer and I'm still not a lawyer. And he, uh, in all my books, I give him high credit and, and say we're real collaborators because we are. He goes through these books when I'm done with them and all the legal stuff when we're doing courtroom. You know, he'll go, we just can't say it that like that. And I'll just go, okay, and it really pisses me off. <laughs> and, you know, I'll give them a, a manuscript that's maybe that thick, and I'll get it back about that thick with paper clips in every page, you know, that he doesn't like stuff. But it makes the books so real. I hope they're real. If they're not, I'm going to fire Al. <laughs> He's done a great job so far. He has done a good job. But don't tell him. He, he really thinks he has, too. But, you know, the good news is he also helps Richard North Patterson. So, you know. You've gotten him a side job. Yeah, side job. And by the way, he just retired three weeks ago. Oh. So, but he's not retired from me, but he's retired from San Mateo County. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, for you, are there certain uh, maybe elements, structural or otherwise, that, that would make a, a good mystery a great mystery? I mean, like, are, are there certain consistencies that really sort of will put a mystery? You know, I really think there's a lot to be said for just having a really great mystery where you have three or four plausible endings and the least obvious one is, for the most obvious reasons, the best one. And sometimes that's happened to me when I've, I've gotten all the way through books and changed it after I've done my whole first draft. I said, you know, really, this is a better guy to do it. Um, but the best mysteries of all are when you don't even know a crime's been committed. 
which I've done in a couple of books where I don't even talk about the crime. There's something else entirely going on. And you watch that all happen and you're engrossed in that. And meanwhile, this other stuff is happening that you don't even see. And then when I drop it on you, you go, oh man, that is diabolical. That is awful. How could he get me like that? And that that's, gives me great joy. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know I, there's a, a book of mine called A Certain Justice that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with a crime. I mean, it, you can read, it's 500 pages long, you read 450 pages and go, hmm, this is an interesting story about race and da -da -da, San Francisco and prejudice and this and that and the other thing. Really, it's about a crime and you're watching it all the time and yet I guarantee you don't see it. So that's, that's about the best thing to do. Yeah. Do you have a favorite Mr. Ryan? Do I have a favorite Mr. Ryan? Well, Sheldon Siegel is a genius. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, just for fun, reader, I mean, reads are, I love Nelson DeMille. Mm -hmm. I just love John Corey, and I think he's such a wise guy, and I just think he's just a joy to read. Um, I love T. Jefferson Parker. Yes. He's fantastic. Um, and you know, I love all the Aubrey Maturin series, you know, those ridiculous, you know, Master and Commander stuff. You know, there was a three year period of my life when I couldn't force myself to read anything else because I just thought he was so brilliant. But I can't say he's for everybody. He's a, you know, he's a very distinctive language style. But man, when I read him, it was like, whoa, you're good, dude. And, you know, I just read him for forever. So, yeah. What is your writing schedule like? How do you, and how often do you think you'd want to write a new book? Like, when can we expect a new one? How often do I think I want to write a new book? I love that question. Okay. I want to write a new book every June because I get paid every June. <laughs> I have a three book deal that I have to hand in my books by a certain time, so I do. Um, my schedule every day is, I mean, today was a perfect example. I get up around uh, 7.30. I have a cup of coffee, then I go to the workout club, and I work out for about an hour and a half. And then I go to my office and sit down and just write. Today I got a whopping three and a half pages done. And that's way too few. I mean, most days I try to get ten, but I have not been doing this on the book I'm writing now. And it's only because I've been on the road, I think, for 21 days. I had to get back yesterday. Was today? Is today Monday? Tuesday. Wednesday. 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 See? Okay. When I got into the office, I the first thing I had to do was read the 170 pages that I had already written because I'd been on the road, you know, walking this book for the last, you know, two months or a month anyway. And doing getting ready for the pub date and all of this stuff. And so finally when I came back, I literally read the last scene I had you know written and I had no idea. <laughs> what it was about, <laughs> what led up to it. I went, how am I going to go on from here? This is crazy. So I had to read the whole book up to that point. Right. So yesterday I wrote two pages, and today I wrote three. I can't say I'm really back on the horse <laughs> right now. Another but I'll be doing that tomorrow, too. Another Dismas Hardy? Pardon? Another Dismas Hardy? It's another Dismas Hardy book. Yeah. All right. Can you talk about this one? The new one? Yes, please. I, I can talk about it, but it'll be brief. I don't know what it's about. <laughs> That's the problem. This, is, we'll feel you oh, this book. <laughs> this new book. Yes, it's new to us. I will in a minute. Okay. Yeah. How close have you come to some movie deals? Really close. Really close. Two years ago, uh, the whole Dismas Hardy series was optioned by Lawrence Fishburne. And uh, we, got a, we got a showrunner, which means an executive producer who's going to put the whole thing together. We had a director, we had a writer, we had two stars, Hardy and Glitzky. And we had, you know, it got approval on the, the uh, studio level, uh, Paramount Studios and CBS Studios. And then we went to the networks and we were told that Friday would be the, you know, the cutter, Fisher Cut Bay day. And on Thursday night, we got a call from the guy we were dealing with who said, we're going, we're doing it. I said, great, about time. Woke up the next morning, went in, they changed their mind. So that's how close we came so far. And we are still trying to work, you know, a little bit of that magic with Lawrence Fishburne, but we're open for other offers too. In case you have, in case, pardon me? 
try to use Trans it. Yeah, well, we're, believe me, we're looking, but. Because Elmore Leonard's series oh, sure. justified these. Yeah. yeah, well, it's a matter of they find you and they call you, so, yeah. Since you said you were talking about the Ophelia cut, it was interesting beside the story, the legal strategy, which I found uh, uh, interesting also. Have you read the book? I, I have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yes, I read the book. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, one of the things, I really, really like this book a lot. And one of the things I liked about it was the fun I had with, for example, eyewitness testimony and how it can be discredited. I mean, there are some really cool things out there in the world. And even a lot of these things I didn't get throughout. I just, you know, was doing a lot of research on my own going, this is just fun. And so I really had a lot of fun with, with um, all of the courtroom stuff in this book. Yes, it's interesting, the uh, uh, voir dire and uh, yeah. the, other, yeah. the other stuff without yeah. coming too much of the book. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I hope we'll all agree with you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When IRS you, guy, what? Right. Well, this is, I guess you might put it to the, <laughs> the other side of the role. When you first dealt with Mr. Fine, yeah. of blessed memory, Yes. <laughs> I never like to speak evil. No, me neither. Yeah. me neither. When you first dealt with him, did you know that the standard practice in the industry was to get a retainer when you entered into a deal? You didn't no. know that. I didn't know anything. When did you first learn that? Probably about four books in. And then did you talk to Mr. Fine about that? Um, no, Mr. Fine was not really good at communicating. <laughs> but he you threw, sound like a good He threw ashtrays. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. He threw ashtrays at people. He got up and jumped on his desk. So why did you continue dealing with him? Because I had an option clause that was draconian and that I stupidly signed. So and it made all of my contracts after the first one exactly the same except for the amount of the advance. And the amount of the advance didn't matter anyway because he didn't pay it. <laughs> okay, thank you. No, really, it was ugly. It was ugly. And I was foolish and stupid. You know, I just didn't know what I was doing. I didn't think of writing as a business at all. It was just something I loved to do. And then suddenly it grew on me as a business. Yeah. One of the books that must have been about eight or ten years ago was about a lot of corruption in the police department and they, they, you know, they have a big shootout scene and stuff like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Was that based on something going on at the time that you knew about or just totally made up? Well, it was kind of, well, it wasn't made up because there really is, a, there are two alternative police departments in San Francisco. Actually, there are three. There's the sheriff's department, there's the police department, and there's the patrol specials. And they're all separate. They, they're all different. And uh, I basically, uh, the book you're referring to is The First Law. And The First Law was based on the idea of the, I mean, I wanted to get a movie deal. And I decided I was going to basically make a retelling of the OK Corral story in modern times, where the marshals fought the sheriffs and, you know, it was the Irks and the Clantons. And that's basically what I based the book on. And, you know, I, I think it's a tremendously successful book. I just love the book. I did. Still one of my favorites. So, but that's what I was coming from. So, should we go to the Ophelia cut for just a brief moment? Mm -hmm. not, yeah. not too much, though. You know? I'm not going to give much away. Okay. He's been doing this a while. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give much away, but I'm going to read a, a, little, a little thing here. Washington. This is just fun because this thing has nothing to do with the book. This is the perfect excerpt to read. And I'm reading it because my son came home from law school yesterday, and it reminded me, as I was going to another signing in my hometown, he reminded me that he really loved this scene because it was a scene that he actually did in his life. And I said, you're right, Jack, except in my scene, did, doesn't the person who plays you, doesn't he die because he was so stupid? And Jack goes, yeah, he did. I said, huh, okay, so I'm gonna read it to you right now. <laughs> this is great, I love this scene. Even when working a case as sensational as the Jessup killing, homicide inspectors never ran out of other work. Now Paul Brady sat in one of the interrogation rooms just off the homicide detail with a suspect named Leon Bryce. Leon was 19 years old. He was in the stolen cell phone business generally, but he had run into some bad luck with his latest victim, a 23-year-old Stanford PhD candidate in mechanical engineering named Jason Eichler. Actually, it had been worse luck for Jason, who was now dead, but things didn't look good for Leon either, who, when he'd been apprehended, was in possession of no fewer than six cell phones 
one of them belonging to Jason's girlfriend, Lily Faraday. The way it had gone down, Lily's testimony, was that she and Jason were at Rome burning a bar on Saturday night. Lily had put her brand new $400 phone down on the table for the time it took her to turn her head and order another drink, and when she turned back, it was gone. Later that night, Jason had run the GPS app to locate the phone and texted a message to it, offering a re reward. Yesterday at around 11 a.m., Jason had gotten a call from Lily's phone, offering it in exchange for the reward, which was how much again? Jason said $100, and the voice on the phone described himself. Black, Afro, 5'10", 160, nice grill on my mouth, black tennis, camo cargo, black t-shirt, stand in the corner, Leavenworth and Ellis, you won't miss me. Oh God. Rather than making any attempt to notify the authorities, who Lily believed would do nothing anyway, for a cell phone, I'm sure. The chivalrous, brilliant, and utterly clueless Jason drove down to the meeting place, one of the most godforsaken intersections mm -hmm. in the city, mm -hmm. yeah. with Lily. Mm -hmm. Saw Leon standing in front of a small posse of guys, then pulled over. After telling Lily to take off in the car, if there was any sign of trouble, Jason got out, waited for her to get in the driver's seat, then crossed the street to conclude the transaction. When Leon produced the cell phone, before Jason gave him the money, he said he wanted to make sure the phone worked. So he stood there, surrounded by gangsters, punching in apps and phone numbers, waiting for answers from a couple of his friends, including Lily, who screamed at him to give the guy his goddamn money and get the hell out of here. Next, Lily had rolled the window down and heard the entire exchange. Jason decided that since he had the phone in his possession and Leon had no rights, since he'd stolen it, he was in a good bargaining position. Reaching for his wallet, he pulled out a 20. That led one of Leon's confreres to grab at the wallet, after which things got out of hand quickly, with punches being thrown and cell phones scattering out onto the street. Jason, a triathlete as well as a scrappy and skilled fighter, kicked at a couple of the guys, swung at a few more, then went to grab for his wallet, which they had torn from his hands and was now on the street. Leon leaned in for the wallet at the same time. Jason pushed him and he went down. Jason went to punch him and then there was a shot and another shot and the brave and foolish Mr. Eichler went down and did not get up. Lily, following Jason's instructions, slammed on the accelerator and fishtailed the BMW down the street. Now Leon was regaling Brady with his version of events. So I'm walking down the street, minding my own business. I see like six, eight phones just lying there. That's where I got them. What am I going to do? Leave them sitting there? I don't think so. Leon Bryce's mother don't raise no fools. There wasn't a body, a dead body, anywhere near those phones. They were just sitting there on the street. I never seen no dead body. How about the witness who described you and what you were wearing by your own description and has picked you out of a lineup with positive identification? What? She white. I'm black. That ain't likely holding up. What about the gun you had on you when they picked you up? You find that too lying in the street? It was in the street. Where you just thrown it, Leon, where your arresting officer saw you throw it. That just ain't true. I ain't never carrying no peace. You can ask anybody. Brady knew it was going to be a long couple of hours before he got anything substantive with Leon, and it wouldn't hurt to let their suspect sweat for a while in the tiny booth. Besides, outside the window, Lee Sher had come over with a very pretty woman of about his age and was giving him this high sign to come out. You keep thinking of things you think I'll believe, Leon, Brady said. I'll be back in here with you in a little while. Hey, Leon said, how about a Coke? I could use a cold Coke. I'll see what I can do. Brady opened the door into the blessedly cool main room, turned and made sure he'd closed and locked the door behind him. So, I love that because that's what my son really did. And he's a law school student at Georgetown. Come on, Jack, think. Anyway. It's fine. It's all good. So anyway, this book, this book I really, 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 really am happy with. Um, it, um, it began in the kind of the uh, crucible of things going wrong with another publisher, I'm afraid to say. But I, I published a book last year called The Hunter, and uh, Dutton did not bring the book out in very substantial numbers, and it didn't do very well because I couldn't find it in any bookstores. So we decided to leave Dutton and go to uh, a new publishing house. So I went, we went to uh, Simon & Schuster and Atria picked me up right away and offered me a three book deal, which was wonderful. But then they said, why don't you do a Dismas Hardy book? Which was good because I was already writing a Dismas Hardy book. <laughs> so this was the Dismas Hardy book I wanted to write. And you know, I've, I've got a, as, as well as a, a son who is sometimes less than intelligent on things like cell phones. I also have a daughter who's wonderful and uh, 
but also has uh, both herself and among her friends probably made a couple of bad decisions in her life. And I'm very close to both of my kids in spite of all my teasing about them. And we talk about these real things. Uh, and this was, a, my daughter uh, had a bunch of friends who were pretty cavalier with uh, their relationships. And sometimes these relationships turned pretty squirrely and bad where people had to get called, parents had to get called, and things had to get done. Uh, and so I decided this was pretty dramatic, natural stuff to put in a book. And since I wanted to really have this be a personal story with Hardy and Klitschke mm -hmm. and Moses McGuire and all of the gang, um, this became a story where Moses McGuire's daughter, who is extremely beautiful, uh, makes some bad decisions with you know, one particular guy and then tries to break up with him and he doesn't like it. And then he may or may not have beaten her a couple of times. He followed her around. And then, um, before you know it, um, it appears that he raped her. Oh my God. And Moses uh, McGuire is, at this time, kind of also, he's an, he's an alcoholic. He's been for six years admitted an alcoholic. And he kind of falls off the wagon in the stress of all of this stuff. And within a couple of days of the rape, this rapist uh, winds up bludgeoned to death. And the trial is the trial of Moses McGuire for the death of this rapist, or alleged rapist. And uh, <clears throat> I can't really say too much about it other than, if you don't think that's going to be a good story, then don't read it. But really, it's a pretty good story. <laughs> There's a lot of good stuff in here. And uh, you know, I'm really happy with the way it turned out. Yay. Yay. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. One so, more question. Yeah. I'm not from San Francisco. I got to answer. Yeah. Could a guy like Wes Farrell really become a district attorney in San Francisco? Oh, yeah. Anybody can become a district attorney. Helen, Helen, district attorney, the guy was a convicted felon. <laughs> okay, that's true. So come on up and I'll sign books. And by the way, here are.